Well, the, the crisis that we're experiencing right now is immediately tied to the COVID lockdown, the global COVID lockdown, which of course basically shut down you know, very significant shares of economic activity all over the world. Now we're coming out of it. COVID, uh, economic impact of COVID would have been far more severe had it not been for massive government interventions to stimulate economies throughout the world. The level of economic stimulus throughout the world under COVID was historically unprecedented in peacetime. I, I'm not exaggerating, never, not, never anything like it. Okay, so now what's happening? Number one is we are coming out of the COVID lockdown, even if the COVID is still spreading as, <clears throat> as a pandemic, it's, we're coming out of the economics of it. So on the one hand, we face that lockdown and we're, and we are experiencing, you know, supply shortages, breakdown of production, and that's emerging in all kinds of ways. For example, in the U S uh, we can't manufacture cars fast enough because we don't have the uh, computer chips to put into the cars. And that's a big source of inflation. So that's one thing that's happening. Another thing is that we are coming, we, you know, we, the stimulus has worn off. And so with the stimulus, massive stimulus um, that uh, was propping up the economy, we're experiencing a slowdown consequent on the, on the uh, phase out of the stimulus program. So it's COVID set the terms, the economics of the COVID, you know, we're talking about uh, just speaking about the United States, if you add everything up, the overall level of stimulus was 40% of the economy, 40% of GDP. I mean, that's bigger than under World War II. Uh, and that, you know, but that has worn off. And so one of the things, for example, there was a uh, significant support for uh, families with children. And we were able to reduce child poverty in the United States in half in one year. Now that, that gives you an example of what you can do if the, if there, the will is there. Now that, that program is eliminated. So what's going on now is child poverty is increasing again because the, the program has ended. So we can extend that uh, to other countries as well. The experience of heavy government intervention to get through the COVID, phasing that out. At the sa same time, during COVID, we had the breakdown of production. So you have these shortages in different parts of the global economy. There are three factors in the overall inflation, not just speaking about Turkey, thinking about the US and maybe in Europe. Uh, number one is the supply chain issues, the shortages. So for example, the fact that we have these shortages of computer chips, which makes it harder to build automobiles, which has driven up the price of used cars because the new supply of cars isn't coming online. So there's a shortage there. Um, secondly, uh, when you do have, you know, the, the COVID was, uh, uh, collapsing the economy. And so that led to higher unemployment, which led to weakening worker bargaining power and l lower wages. So when you have a fast recovery, which we are experiencing due to the stimulus, workers have gotten more bargaining power that has increased wages. Um, and that is a second factor, uh, at least in the countries with which I'm most familiar. So that's a second factor. I would call that a benign source of inflation because workers do deserve wage increases. The third factor is energy. And so we did have a supply uh, chain breakdown in the oil energy market and the heating oil market, compounded by the fact that you're operating in a monopolistic uh, market here so that what the companies have the power to do when there are shortages is to increase their prices far beyond what would be suggested by the, the supply demand uh, experience. So for example, in the US, uh, you know, the gasoline, retail gasoline prices are up 150% uh, from a year and a half ago, pre-COVID. Uh, 
So there's no reason, there's no argument as to why that would happen strictly on the basis of supply shortages. It's that the companies take advantage of the supply shortages and raise prices higher. My own solutions, uh, I think the supply chain issues, for the most part, will work themselves out over the next six to months to a year. Uh, the wage increases are warranted. So we, we have to you know, move toward a higher uh, wage economy and, and operate under those circumstances. So, so what we've seen you know, under neoliberalism for the last 40 years or so is a, a fundamental feature of neoliberalism is that uh, workers lost power and could not get wage increases. And that is now baked into the economic structure and so uh, the, the mere fact of workers trying to get modest wage increases is uh, leading to inflation because the businesses got used to workers never getting wage increases. So they marking up their prices. So that, I think, as, as I said, that I would call that a benign source of inflation, and we can live with that, workers' wages. If workers get a, a wage increase, it doesn't mean that businesses necessarily have to raise their prices. It just means the alternative is that you know the businesses either improve their productivity or they take somewhat lower profits. And that would be moving away from the neoliberal framework. Then the third factor is on energy. We need high energy prices. We're in a climate crisis due to burning fossil fuels to produce energy. So I personally do not favor the price of oil or gasoline coming down to encourage more consumption. But rather, I would say, we, as is a, pr a proposal now in Congress, in the US Congress, is to tax the, the profits of the oil companies and distribute them to everybody so that that compensates people for the higher fossil fuel energy prices, but at the same time, will encourage them to become more efficient in the use of energy, and then to also move towards clean energy, green energy, solar energy, wind energy, which is cheaper. It's actually cheaper than fossil fuel energy. So that, that would be my kind of approach with respect to the inflation. I think that we have to recognize, myself speaking as a person of the left, uh, that we need to solve the climate crisis within capitalism because we don't have time to wait for a transition to some socialist economy that's going to take a long time to tr transition. So Green New Deal, just like the 1930s New Deal, uh, was an egalitarian program within capitalism. So we, uh, we think about what are the existing institutions? How can we work within the existing policy framework and institutions? And yeah, it will mean that there are going to be, let's say, green energy companies that are capitalist and that make profits. And we want to actually encourage investments by those companies. Now, one of the things that's going to happen is if you are incentivizing and subsidizing green capitalists, then you can also set up labor standards, environmental standards and labor standards. So it is an opportunity to expand worker power unionization uh, because we are going to have a large-scale increase in employment in these sectors. They are going to be getting government subsidies, and so you can condition their subsidies on, on establishing uh, good labor standards. I mean, in the U.S., for example, we've had for a long time in pu public procurement, in government contract jobs, uh, construction jobs, they have good labor standards. If you can, you can get a job as a construction worker on a government job, you're going to make twice as much money, your wages, and say, if we're going to have large-scale green investments, which we absolutely need, then we can also have labor standards attached to it. And that's part of the, that's part of the deal. When I myself first started researching about the green ec economy, it was exactly on the issue around labor because the, um, the f initial premise is that if you're going to transition to a green economy, it's going to shut down a lot of jobs and it's going to cause unemployment. And therefore, we have to trade jobs versus 
environment, one or the other. Uh, and my own research has really been trying to understand that. And my conclusion is, in, in fact, building the green economy will be a huge source of new jobs creation. People uh, investing in a new energy sector, uh, related activities. It's the investments create jobs. Invest in anything. Invest in a bubblegum factory you will create jobs for the workers in the bubblegum factory. So the same thing holds for green energy, except that we, what uh, some of my own research and uh, co-workers, we show that the in employment opportunities are very, very substantial. Now, at the same time, we know that the fossil fuel d industry it has to phase out. Those jobs will be lost. So we can't confuse the two things. It's not all jobs are going to be lost. Fossil fuel jobs will be lost. So for those jobs, the fossil fuel industry, we need to have a transition program to move people who will see their jobs phased out into other active, into other jobs. And so that should include employment guarantees that they get a new job. It should include a wage guarantee that their wage is the same, at least. It should include a pension guarantee that you don't lose your pension. It should include as needed uh, retraining and even if you need relocation. So those would be the critical features. Well, certainly the, the oil companies are not. The coal company, the, why would they? This is their business. Uh, so, but the other companies, there's no reason that they shouldn't. So if we take Turkey and take the uh, Professor Yeldon's important work that's forthcoming on this. Um, this is actually a huge opportunity for growth, uh, for new businesses. In fact, one of the features of the green economy is the capacity to operate on a much smaller scale than, you know, big monopolistic energy companies or electric utilities. So you can have small scale co-ops, you can have community solar, uh, all of these things are possible and they, they are cropping up. I can tell you even in the US, one of the biggest sources of, of green energy, ironically, are farmers in the Midwest that generally vote for Republicans. But they themselves are benefiting because they have the farmland, they put up wind turbines, the turbines will generate electricity, they make more money. And then you have and you have co-ops being formed in that way. So those are some of the opportunities that are emerging for new uh, business ownership forms. Cooperative, socialist, capitalist, all of them. The, the levels of inequality under neoliberalism, independent of any issues around the environment, is obscene, right? I mean, we had vast disparities of income and wealth. 50 years ago, but nothing like now. I mean, if we take the, just my own country again that I'm most familiar with, you know, the difference between an average worker and an average corporate top executive CEO, in 1970, the average CEO made 20 times more than the average worker. So it was the average worker making, say, $50,000 a year in today's dollars, the average CEO made $2 million. Now, the average worker still makes about 50000 and the average CEO is making $20 million. So it's, it's tenfold increase in inequality. Again, that is independent of anything to do with the green economy. So we have to defeat neoliberalism uh, to reverse the vast inequalities. And then in terms of you know, who's creating emissions, well, rich people consume more than poor people by definition. So we want to, you know, make create a more egalitarian transition path. And then in addition to that, we have them consuming green energy. So if rich people are still, they're still going to be rich people. They'll still have their yachts. They'll still travel more on airplanes. But over time, A, we want to reduce the disparities and B, we want to eliminate the emissions as being at least part of the equation that is defining the differences between low income and high income. The lesson that I get from the war 
with respect to nuclear is it whatever I thought about nuclear before, I'm more convinced that it is a bad solution. Why? Well, what did Putin do? I mean, the first thing he, I mean, not the first, within four days, he was at Chernobyl. He went right to Chernobyl. He recaptured Chernobyl. Um, and, you know, he, he can use that as a weapon. He's, well, I'm going to re release radioactivity. And, you know, in Chernobyl, though it's shut down, they still have, you know, the high heat fuel rods that have to be cooled. And they're cooled through electricity. If, if, if Putin turned off the electricity for one day, the rods would heat up and it would, they would explode and release radioactivity. He didn't do that. He could have done that. So, you know, there's going to be Putins in the world. He's not the only bad guy. Uh, and so creating a world where we have ever more nuclear energy just creates more opportunities for these extreme dangers. I don't really see that as a long-term solution. I would say that my, the way I interpreted what's happened since the war is the you know, ever more significant and ever more intense commitment we need to make to renewable energy because it's clean and it's safe. Uh, nuclear, you can say, is clean in that it, you can generate electricity with no uh, CO2 emissions, but it's not safe and it's never going to be safe.